SI2 panel on uh, PDK and PDK development challenges. Uh, the PDKs, of course, connect the uh, process to design. So what is uh, SI2? SI2 is an R&D joint venture where we work together, we collaborate to, uh, to solve common problems in the industry. We have a bunch of members of, of foundries, fabulous manufacturers, EDA companies, several initiatives going on, uh, the open access initiative that everybody knows about that's the base uh, uh, database that, everybody, that the various EDA vendors use, the compact model coalition, which is uh, spice simulation models, and open standards, which where we develop new standards and prototype implementations for uh, supporting IC design. Here, here's a list of, of the logos of our, uh, uh, our members, and uh, we're almost running out of space, but if you're not already a member and you want to join, we'll find space for you. Uh, the PDK panel, uh, I'll, I'll be introducing everybody in just a minute, but uh, I'm Ted Payone. I'm uh, the, the moderator and an uh, employee of SI2. I've been doing PDKs since before we could spell PDKs. They were uh, uh, essentially just lists of rules that we used that eventually became uh, sets of P-cells and rule decks and other such things. Uh, Sue Strang from IBM, uh, uh, Dan Klein from uh, Sandkelp, who's been in this business almost as long as I have, uh, Jorik Dablowski from XFAB, and uh, Dr. Daude Ansango from uh, Qualcomm. We're going to have uh, some panel presentations, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of discussion. So we're looking at the issues and opportunities that are there in PDK development. Basically, if the PDK is wrong, you can't create working chips. So you got to make sure that you've got a high-quality PDK and have tested it in the various design flows. As we get into in different processes, adding things like MEMS and silicon photonics, or getting into these newer geometries, the, uh, the PDKs are much more complex than they used to be. I was at TSMC several years ago and I was talking about how when I got into this industry, the uh, design rule deck, or the, 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 the design rule manual was eight pages. They had eight pages for their metals, for their metal stack, so it, it, it's, uh, quite complex. We've got new elements coming into the design flows such as MEMS and silicon photonics. And in addition, all of these EDA vendors around here are creating new tools and you have to be able to feed those tools with sets of rules. And, and everybody has diff a different set of rules or a different way of formatting those rules and you have to be able to generate those. If we look at a set of PDK inputs, inputs come from all over the place, whether you're getting the basic process inputs, you have litho inputs, uh, inputs from design. What is your design intent and the design style? Uh, and uh, even CAD has inputs and in what are your targeted flows? When we're looking at outputs, we're seeing that we've got to output simulation models and tie those simulation models into the symbols that we use. For the devices, we have the symbols and the parameters and the callbacks. Uh, we have rule decks, and each of those rule decks come in three different flavors. And if you saw the presentation this morning, there's a lot of complex things happening in these rule decks. If we look at kind of a generic PDK flow, we have all of these process inputs from these various uh, groups, and they are collected by various sets of tools. A PDK generation engine then is used to create the various 
PDKs, whether they're market segmented PDKs, and then you have to push them into verification to make sure that those PDKs work before you send them out to design. So our speakers today, our first one is Dan Klein. He's the technical director of SanCal. Uh, he leads teams, large teams, up to 35 uh, engineers, has been in this uh, and has done oh. memories. memories, yeah. Uh, that, that's what you get for relying on spell checker. Um, I started in Motorola uh, in Israel. We're, we're both Motorola babies. I started here in Austin in 78. Um, and it, I met Dan when he was at, at Moss Aid in Canada and then PMC Sierra. It's over 30 years of developing tools, uh, both externally and working, uh, working with external vendors and developing internal design tools. And he published a book, a great book called CMOS Layout Concepts, Methodologies, and tool, Tools in 2001. He's trying to get out the, uh, the new version, but I owe him a chapter and I've owed, owed him a chapter for a while, so he, he's on the panel to, and, and so he can make sure that so he can make sure I get that chapter done. Uh, Jorg Dablowski is a the director of design support for XFab, and I've known Jorg since he got into this business a long time ago, <laughs> and and uh, watched him uh, develop. He his, he's in charge of developing the design kits for the analog, digital, memory, and ESD. Uh, designs for XFab. Uh, he supports the design flows, including direct customer support. So if you call, you might get him on the phone. He's got many years of PDK development, including not only the, the, the P cells, technology files, and PDK verification, but also the PDK development flow itself. He has a degree in engineering and information, electrical engineering and information technology from the Technical University of Ilmen <laughs> Il Il Ilmenau, okay. Germany, Germany yeah. Uh, Sue Strang, an another uh, uh, another longtime uh, PDK developer, is a se senior engineer at, uh, at IBM and uh, up, uh, she lives in Albany, but she work, or she lives in Vermont, but uh, works with the group in Albany. She's been a principal developer for PDKs and PDK systems uh, at, at uh, IBM up in uh, Essex Junction, Vermont. Beautiful place. Has done lots of things like models and, and the full design kits for all sorts of different processes. Uh, and has been very active in the user community and in the standards community as well. And, and my new friend, uh, Dr. Daudi Ansango, uh, is got, he, he's a Texas Longhorn. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, not only got his BS in, in electrical engineering here at UT, but uh, his, his master's and his PhD, uh, where he was focused on whatever that means. Um, but I worked in analog and mixed signal at IBM in the, uh, from 65 down to 14 nanometers and uh, joined the Qualcomm uh, data center group. I guess he got uh, tired of the snow up there in New York and came back down to Austin. Um, and, and so he works as an advocate for the uh, design team and uh, PDK enablement tools. And, so it's his job to enforce and implement the uh, DFM methodologies and practice to make sure that you're getting good yield and good performance and reliability and track those changes uh, and developing on uh, and their impact on the product. So I'm going to start off, cha change the slides real quick and uh, uh, start off with Dan. Um. Hello, everybody. Um, I am a technical director for Sankal, but at the same time, I'm managing the Canadian team. So I'm involved in things that Sankal does to service customers. 
Sankalp is, uh, to give you a small introduction, is a company f with more than 600 people. Um, has four centers, four design centers in India, one in Europe, two in US, one in Dallas in San Jose, and one in Canada in Ottawa. And in terms of services, how do we relate to PDKs? We are doing analog and mixed signal design, we are doing physical design, digital design, SRAM design, but, and technology foundation. And as part of this, I always think that automation and control of process is very important, and that's why we start being involved in PDKs. So let's see what is our opinion about PDKs. Why do companies touch the PDK? One main reason is because today every company wants second source. When you want second source, your problem is that none of your models is neither of the two. So you have to invent a <clears throat> middle of the road who is never as good as any one of them, but is the least worst common denominator. And uh, <clears throat> we have to use, not only invent this new PDK, but this PDK has to be compatible with all the tools you use in-house. And in many cases, um, you have internal tools, and for that internal tools, you have to generate additional um, callbacks for the PDKs. The second uh, reason why people uh, have to touch PDKs, in our experience, is when tools do not align all the time with the PDKs and the versions of PDKs do not align with the versions of the software. Um, in this case, we start from simple things like rule files, VLC, LVS being the simplest ones, actually. The most complex one, actually, the models for simulation because you'll have a lot more things that can move up and down. So let's see examples of things that we had to touch. Oh, I pressed the button. Okay. So um, in terms of added values, PDK QA, we are doing a lot of PDK QAs for different companies. Um, the things that we have to touch, we do a QA for P cells for models, for rule files, for environment, for simulation, QC, and for regression. And for each one of these, we decided to provide you, has to be towards the computer. We decided to provide an example of uh, when do all these things happen. So for, uh, uh, I, I'm the one who moved it. I moved it. I moved it. So, for example, in case of a P-cell QA, what are the things we do? Well, we have to check the P-cell has any DLC violation. And in many cases, checks that all the CDF callbacks, like the multiple, the factor, and so on, are actually working properly for the P-cell. In this case, specifically P-cell, it's our problem. Uh, we have to detect all the P-cell uh, errors. And in many cases, this problem ar arises from using Pi cells and trying to suck them into cadence because for whatever reason this interface is not running smoothly we know who is interested in this not running smoothly but for us it's very good because we have a job and we have to go and fix it in terms of um, simulation we check that the create net list is for all the devices we have to verify if simulator gives any warning so we do reports for all this stuff Post layout simulation, we compare the waveforms for each version of P cells versus, uh, oh, sorry, each version of the simulator versus each version of PDK. Um, somehow, fabs um, are not telling everything, so we have to run the post layout simulation to figure out if it's true or not. Um, we uh, we do um, we report um, to PDK developer all the deviations, and then in some cases we make the changes, some cases they make the changes by themselves. In terms of problems we encounter and how we solve them, we decided to provide one more step. We give you the problem and we, we tell you what how we solved it. We had rule compilation errors, so in many cases we debug the issue and ask Foundry to correct. Interesting enough, everybody says we are all the time correct. Two out of three 
it's not. So it's a lot, two thirds of, of, of um, quality are not happening. So the solution is we write uh, wrappers for each a version and we detect when the results are not what is expected and automatically the customer says, okay, this is the PCR I have to file with the fab. In terms of PCR evaluation failures, we have different combination of parameters and based on this, for example, in, uh, in 65 nanometers PDK, we don't want to say the name of the foundry, will give piece elevation failure when width is 12 and length is 24. So we don't know what combinations they checked, but in one specific combination fails. So we built regressions in such a way that you can test all the numbers compared to all the numbers and we provide a report. So we detect where the report is not coming out correctly. Then we have default values in CDF parameters that are incorrect. And in this case, we have an example of 180 nanometers when the default length is not matching with technology. So whatever you see with whatever the process is, is not exactly the same. And you know, we'll expect for 180 nanometers, which is a 15 years process to be stable, well, it's not happening either. So we obviously report and then goes back to the fab and the fab has to update. Uh, we took the liberty to go one step ahead and propose a few improvements to the P-cell because this forum, in our hope, will be a lot of users. So the users will take these ideas and go and push the changes. Um, metal 4 for drain source instead of metal 1. Uh, you don't have this option. And you will say, when do you need it? Well, when you go with electromigration powers and you start to have a lot of voltage needs in uh, automotive industry. This should be very helpful. Uh, to change the B-box for P-cells. Uh, to flatten particular layers in the P-cells so we can use a tap connection in particular layer instead of the one that is provided. Very important, which we hope uh, the new environments will bring up, it's automatically calculating the P-cell metal one width based on current. And you will say, how is this possible? Well, Cadence is advertising today the EAD. Let's see EAD at work in actually our needs. Um, so I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Eight minutes. Tech support. Okay, coming now to Foundry. So I'm from XFAB Semiconductors. So my talk will deal with high quality design kits and why it's even necessary to have this and what are the opportunities and challenges from a Foundry perspective. Um, to give you a bit of overview about XFAB, so uh, we are not targeting the very aggressive 40 nanometer FinFET technologies, such things. We are known to be the more than more foundry with long years of experience in, in those areas to support automo automotive analog mixed signal designs with feature rich technologies, um, with flexible combinations of CMOS, SOI, MEMS, and a lot of um, options like power, high voltage, analog sensors, and, and such things. We have dedicated MEMS uh, facilities and in total five uh, wafer fabs over the world with 72,000 eight inch equivalent wafers and two and a half thousand uh, employees worldwide. So, hmm? or maybe. So I'm from our design support department so uh, we are proud to, to offer what we think is best in class in terms of foundry design support. So uh, we have very feature rich, high quality PDKs for all the major EDA vendors.
We do all of our IP development, like standard cells, analog cell development, I.O., memory, embedded, uh, non-volta memories, all in-house, because we think this way we are closer to the process and are faster to supporting our customers. So we are, most of our customers doing automotive, so quality is a very big uh, topic here, uh, especially in terms of model um, quality. Uh, all this has to work in the Six Sigma range over the automotive temperature range, minus 40 to 175 degree. So yeah, as I'm from design support, I will t in this talk um, um, yeah, focus on this um, design support aspect and the feature-rich PDKs. So next, please. So the question is how to develop the uh, high quality. I think there are three different aspects. It doesn't work, this guy. So it's standardization of formats and inputs. It's uh, automation of tasks and it is learning from what we already know from, uh, next please, from um, software development. So we should consider PDK to be software. This is quite important. So, and I can just give one example for all those aspects. Of course, we have much more in, in our, yeah, what, what we use in, in our case. So, um, maybe you just quickly click, 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 and do all the animation, and go on and go on. And okay. So, um, for standardization, I have one example. This is our P-Cell kit. So, since uh, many years, we are using a common platform here to develop all the P-Cells for all the EDA vendors and all of our process nodes based on a package which de defines all the um, core functions, all the, let's say, methodology without having any technology dependent stuff inside. So this is uh, what is called here the core PCL features. And this is compiled together with a uh, technology specific part which makes it a PCL library at the end, which maps those structures to, to some uh, technology depending layer information and so on. So this is what we use Meanwhile, for, um, for nodes from one micron, 800 volt um, devices down to 130 nanometer, and um, it's quite flexible. And if you do some more click, the result here, we are able to provide uh, compatible P-cells with identical features, performance, and layout over different EDA vendors. So automation here. Um, something I would like to mention is a, what we call SpecDB. It's kind of an executable specification, you could, could say, or the first step into this direction. Uh, if, if I look at the development as it was done, no, stop, 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 please. One back. Go one back. If I look at the development as it was done several years ago, um, we had our PCL kit, okay, now the technology depending stuff needs to go inside, so what happened, the, the, the developer was looking into the PDF file, was, uh -huh, this is this parameter, type in and so on, do all this manually, so this was kind of error prone, and meanwhile we have a database system here, which is used to generate those PDF files, but also to import those parameters, so this is a big step in, in this automation direction. And finally, uh, looking at, at best practices for software development. Um, deep, reg uh, deep regression is quite important and I think Dan in his presentation also pointed this out. So we have a system in-house which enables us to automatically do DRC and LVS on a very large pattern set, automatically collecting the results and comparing at the end that DRC and LVS is clean and not only this but also layout is X or match between the different EDA vendors we are supporting. Because from time to time customers tend to, you know, go from one to the other. Okay, coming to, to the challenges. If I look at PCL verification, uh, some items are quite easy to do and, and to solve. So is DRC clean over all corners? I think we can prove with PCL Verify, LVS as well. Then the question, is the PCL layout created as intended? So is it, is it is done like according to the parameters? This is not told by DRC. Also after code update, are there only the intended changes or has ever anything else changed? Maybe something um, was at a minimum rule at a one uh, version and now is a, at a larger value, which is also not flagged at the DRC. So how is my coverage? There are some tools which, which can give you some coverage numbers, but if you look in detail, they will only tell you that you went through every line of your code. But if you think about PCL coverage, that's more, because you have to uh, think about uh, what are the, uh, the points of interest which, which have to be uh, checked. Yeah, and how to automate such uh, interactive features as, as are now shown. So 
we have a nice feature to connect a large driver, place, place a, a power uh, MOS device, place a specific P-cell, trigger a routine and then get a final layout. So this is kind of an interactive flow, how to automate such things. And then um, other challenges come from MEMS and, and Opto. So both have their own rules. If you look at such uh, MEMS microphone example here, taken from the Coventer website, uh, they have circular shapes, they have any angel shapes. Sometimes, for instance, for Opto Pixel, you have very large, dense layouts. Uh, but all they have to go finally through the through our mass tooling input. They, the GDS m must be processable at, at, the, at the fab. So if you just do some clicks, um, those uh, tools usually do not support any angel shapes. And deangling could result in a large database, which is then hard to, to you know, let's say, handle. And layer operation on circular shapes can result in hmm, strange structures. So this is not all solved. I think there are still a lot of challenges around the MEMS, for instance. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Sue Strang from um, the IBM um, division, research division. So, so I, I don't think I need to really explain about IBM. I think everybody knows about, <laughs> about IBM Corporation, but I do want to talk a little bit about our, if you can go on, about our foundry um, history. Uh, so. Before um, um, 0.5 microns, we were all in-house. Everything was in-house and hand-drawn. And then after 0.5 microns, we, we entered into the foundry business and also entered into the PDK business. And as the, PDK, as the um, technologies got more and more complex and there's more uh, um, uh, difficulties or uh, complexities involved into the PDKs, uh, we also grew with that. Um, and also, uh, everything, um, so in our 200 millimeter line uh, is all, and, and it's still a very active line, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of designs in it because it's a, um, the RF and analog line, and so, uh, and high voltage devices as well. Uh, photonics have been introduced to that. So as that has grown in complexity of devices, the other technologies have grown in complexity of um, structure. So the complexity of design rules, as Ted was saying, the design rules have become uh, quite uh, intense. And also uh, with the patterning that's introduced in the um, advanced nodes, that becomes even more complex. So at IBM, uh, I don't know if um, it, it, 2015, our manufacturing was sold to Global Foundries, so all of this, all of this is now a Global Foundries offering, and um, our advanced notes are in research still stay with IBM. So we're, I'm in a um, particularly unique, uh, I went from totally Foundry to now we're fabulous, and so I have a different viewpoint on things these days. So um, if you can go on, yes please. Oh, I guess I can do it. Thank you. So our, our foundry development flow, um, much like Jörg was saying, you get, you get all your information from design manuals, um, and specifications on particular devices, um, models, and LVS, and our, our test structures. And they're all in different um, input. And, and, um, and we get them from uh, PDFs. We get them from uh, DITA or XML format. We get them from... Um, you know, paper napkins if we can get them. And then the development is each one of them has to have, uh, we tried to make each of our PDKs very um, similar so that our translation from PDK to PDK is easier for the designers. So as they go up in nodes, they can just 
you know, actually use the same uh, structures and migrate their designs from node to node. However, that being said, whenever we have our, our, our RF and our foundries, again, we have uh, customers that have different um, uh, needs in, in different uh, tool sets. So we support many, many different tool sets as well. So uh, different flows from different companies and they all have to integrate together. And so that's where the testing comes in play. So we've written an in-house testing procedure that goes through all the complexities of the, the P cells and matches it to the LVS, the DRC, and the model. So one of the major um, aspects of the quality of a PDK is how well it matches your process and how well it matches um, your modeling. So that's for the foundry. And, and then um, to go on to the fabless, the fabless, we get these particular things that we have before from the from the foundry. So those are, are now input into our, and so any of our development of our in-house tools or any of the complexities that we have for our own methodologies, we have to add on. And so we're learning that, um, you know, a, a tech file is not necessarily the same from foundry to foundry and how, um, uh, how things are, are, are characterized are not the same either. So now we have to integrate uh, into our system and we find that um, standards would be very helpful in, um, in importing um, custom methodologies and custom devices and also validating from technology to technology. So, um, so I have been a member of the SI2 Open um, PSL standards for um, several years, and uh, this is a model of um, what we are working on and in SI2 um, Open PDK to work with an XML-based um, source to put our PDK information in, including the DDF, which is um, other, that's the design data format, which is somewhat like a CDF that you might be familiar with. And so, and the tools interface is how it interfaces into the different um, their, um, validation tools and models. And so if we, on the Foundry side, if we can get all of that information into an XML-based format and we can um, render out of that through a parser into an open PDK PCEL source code, in which case we can take Skill, Python, and other languages and create a, uh, a PDK. So um, from our perspective on open PDK P cells, uh, standardization and device information really does yield need to be better syncing between the design and manufacturing. I mean, you really need to have uh, standardizations if you're going to be comparing foundry to foundry and technology to technology. Um, open PDK, um, is proving to utilize code blocks and, and we can get them directly from vendor languages and it will make ease of adoption rather than have everything uh, custom. Uh, it's really, uh, it's um, well aligned to, uh, as Yurt said, that we do a lot of um, design automation in uh, creating our PDK. So Open PDK is well aligned with our goals of automating that as much as we can. and. Um, we also work with a lot of partners in IBM and the advanced nodes. So uh, not all of the, the, in the Albany Nanotech Center, there's a lot of, um, uh, we have various partners and then they have different PDK standards too. And so an open PDK specification allows us to be more in line with our partners. So what I see as the challenges is the import of the device information into XML right now is manual and, and we'd like to, um, work on that to make it autom automated to get it from your current PC, um, PDK into an XML format so that we can go through the open PDK flow. That's our challenges for the upcoming year. Also, um, advanced technology knows um, there's a lot of features that are coming in that are becoming more complex um, uh, design strategies. Um, may, they require features that may not uh, necessarily be included in the standard. So we have to uh, keep abreast of that as we go along. It, it has to be kind of a, a, a flexible standard. <laughs> um, so uh, 
Our other concern is because we're going to have multiple vendor implementation that um, the concern for me at least is a testing matrix because then we'd have to test each one of those flows and make sure that it is exactly what we want. Um, and we need to uh, evaluate the methodology for multiple PCEL implementations because there are several that will go through. And I think that's all. Thank you. I didn't use this at all. Right. Oops, sorry. <laughs> all right. I guess uh, I'm going last here. Hopefully everybody is awake. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Daudi Onsongo. Uh, I'm with Qualcomm, the data center group. Um, as he brings the slides up, you know, I, I first came to Austin uh, 23 years ago. For those of you who are uh, not from Austin or visiting, uh, welcome to Austin. And, and make sure you go see the bats one of these evenings. It's a lot of fun and just enjoy the weirdness uh, of Austin. And I'm originally from, from Kenya. Um, you see my name tag here says David. You can call me David or Daudi. Um, so uh, I guess I used the uh, I use the widescreen uh, slides. So. All right, there you go. Does this thing work? I told him to turn it. Oh yeah. I guess this doesn't work, so you have to turn it for me. So uh, uh, we can just do all the tabs on this slide. I want to quickly just go over kind of my career highlights and my, my role right now. I actually started out in, uh, in uh, device design. I was talking with, with Sue right before I was, I was at IBM. And uh, even in graduate school, um, my, our focus at the time, this was in, in the early 2000s, was how are we going to extend Moore's Law and extend scaling, right? And so there was all these non-traditional scaling the techniques that were incorporated uh, starting from nan nanometers down that have really made PCL complexity uh, increasingly hard at every technology node. And so my career has kind of tracked that trajectory, uh, moving from a device designer, more dealing more with, uh, transitioning more into a role where I was uh, um, working with a design team from the technology side and then transitioning into a role where I'm in the design team as a technologist uh, doing doing design as well as interacting with a technology team. And through my career, what I've noticed is as we go with each technology node, the complexities that uh, the technologists are facing have to be reflected uh, well in our, our tool sets, in, our, in all the EDA tools, in our PDKs. And because of the complexity and because there are sometimes very different um, specialty areas, just from in terms of subject experts, it's sometimes hard to enable that that communication to happen and, and um, to get the to get everything captured in time, especially when you're in the bleeding edge and development cycle. And it's more important, more and more, for um, technology, the, all the EDA tools, all the EDA vendors, the PCEL, everything that, that's related to PDK to be tightly coupled and to have uh, interlock there. And so. I've actually enjoyed a career trajectory where I'm working a lot of times on that. There's no, not a single week that uh, an issue dealing with PDK doesn't come across my desk. And right now, um, I'm, I'm with Qualcomm's uh, uh, data center team. Um, it's an exciting time at Qualcomm. Most of you maybe know Qualcomm as a mobile provider and telecoms of hardware. Um, and we are expanding, and Qualcomm is committed to offering a competitive product for the data center based on ARMS. And so. Uh, it's a really fun time to be there, and uh, we're working at both the cutting edge of technology and design uh, to deliver a uh, competitive product uh, here in the near future. So if, if, if my perspective, if you go to the next, uh, next slide, um, um, just you can stop there. What, one of the, fir the first challenge that I see, and Sue kind of touched on this a little bit, is uh, especially at the bleeding edge, right, is trying to get the fabs to buy in and share proprietary data share their secret sauce, right? That's gonna be, that's gonna be the, first, the first challenge. We're able to overcome that, and I see probably an N-1, N-2 nodes that might happen much easier, and we can build on that. And then there's some of these incremental, probably I'm gonna kinda go in complexity. Uh, the, first of the, the first challenge and opportunity that I see is just the design manual, I think Ted touched on this earlier, is we've, we've seen design manuals become so complex over the time, right? 
And is there a way that if we had standards and if we had infrastructure that was common, that we could maybe modernize the whole design manual, right, to, to begin with? So it should be secure, should be web-based, you know, all these things that we can, we, can, we can incorporate to really leverage all the technology that we've developed over the last 20 years is not reflected in how we deliver PDKs and just start from the design manual, right? So that's one of the things, just revision control, embedding calculators, somebody mentioned about EM and the P-cells, right? Just um, how am I sure that I'm okay for TDDB? A lot of times we go and look at equations in the design manual, we try to make you know calculations, but how can we embed even smarter things like calculators inside them? This is all possible by just going web-based, right? Even better search, you know, you have an 800 page uh, design manual. How do you find the information that you need? All these things can be really done well. If everybody's collaborating, if we have standards, we can all work on these things. And they're things that everybody benefits from, right? And then uh, next, the next thing is um, maybe more still aesthetics in a way and information. Because the reason why I'm sensitive to this is a lot of questions come to me from design. I'm sitting in a design team. I'm the only technologist or one of few in a design team. And I have to know all the subject experts in the company, connect people, and you become like a like a traffic, uh, traffic police for information, right? But some of these tools would really help um, dis disseminate information quickly to designers, uh, to PD teams, right? Like, especially when you're on the bleeding edge, you're dealing with revisions of a PDK. What changed, right? What can, what, you know, what device options, are there new devices? Did they remove some? What are my critical layers? You know, did that change? And, and um, I think somebody mentioned that you can have like a whole section of the manual just on your back end of line stack. You know, is there a way we can make that easy so a designer can go in there, uh, put in his specific stack, generate his stack information and all that? And that's, it could be, it could be done if we have standards that everybody can build on and protocols that everybody can work with, that the whole industry can 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 move to. And um, next uh, is now moving a little bit more to more complex, like how do we develop standards for just P-cell and verification? And um, I think it was, I think it was Dan who talked about just even just the simulating and, and making sure that everything is okay, what are my callbacks okay, what is allowed? And then take that to the next level. How do we integrate that back to our, our um, model reference guides or our design guides, right? Um, if I have a P-cell, I should be able to generate IV curves that I can overlay on what the foundry is giving me. And is it the same? And, you know, am, am I okay? So, you know, we, you can look at these things kind of in progressively uh, difficult steps. But, you know, if we can standardize, standardize P-cells, if you think about it, um, you know, 15 years ago when we were in planar moss, and now when we're in FinFET, it's a completely different different uh, regime, but basically it's a transistor. So if we can you know, develop standards that everybody agrees upon, develop verification uh, methodologies that everybody agrees upon, output standards for what we need to output when we verify so that it can be compared, uh, I think this would, be, this would be really a great opportunity for open PDK to drive this. And then for, you know, for SOC teams like, like uh, where I'm in, if you go to the next point, um, a lot of times we use third-party IP. So we have, you know, we have an external vendor. We don't, we, we don't really worry too much about their PDK. We kind of go based on trust that they're following the same procedure we are following. But how do we verify that? You know, and, and how do we make sure? So you know, with Open PDK, this kind of gives you a way to be able to exchange information, compare. Um, and, and I think that's a really huge opportunity for, for open PDK. For all these SOC, a lot of people are just picking IP and putting things together as SOC teams. And they, they could be taking, they could have several different third party IP vendors. This could make it seamless uh, to do. I mean, some of the things that happen is you have a, you have a, a net list, you're running a, a simulation on to verify that the third party IP is compatible with whatever timing requirements you have and you get, an ex you get an extracted netlist from them, what did they, how did they extract it? How do you verify that? You know, what, what PDK version were they using? Was it the same as you're using? And, and things like that. So there's ways that we, with the open PDK, that all that can be verified. Uh, it would really uh, help this third party. And I think especially for fabs, these are some of the areas that would really help them as they, um, as they go out getting customers. And um, finally now is like leading for the future. Um, you know, some of these, if you attend a lot of the sessions uh, in this conference and others, right, 
variation, layout effects, smart layout tools, and correct by construction, as, especially as DRC complexity is getting harder and harder with every node. A lot of our tool vendors, they're coming up with tools, but how, how do we maybe integrate that and kind of lead the way from a PDK standpoint, make sure they have all the hooks, make sure that across tool vendors that we're able to be compatible, right? And a lot of this takes back to our PDK because in the end it goes back to what are the restricted design rules versus what are the DRC rules and you know what's the EM or, 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 or front of the line reliability requirements? Um, how bad is the variation? How can we, can we reflect that easily, especially for static timing, right? Some of that all relates back to how well we can design our PCL standards. And if people come together and share, I think you can lead that innovation and integrate it from bottom up. So those are the opportunities that I see um, um, as a, basically as a technologist in a, in a design team. And you know, I, I think there's a great future for the PDK. If we can get over the hurdle of working with our foundries, um, it would be really good. I want to, that's all I had to say thank you for, uh, for attending today and I want to acknowledge my colleagues and of course my boss. Are there any questions? I have a question from the panel to the panel. Uh, being a big company and having so many resources, did you think about the process independent design kit that will verify all the PDKs all the time and do regression? Are you looking at IBM or Qualcomm? I'm looking at Qualcomm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, yeah, so uh, we of course have our own internal PDK release and verification process. That's about all I can say. Okay. <laughs> IBM, anything? So are, you, are you proposing that um, there would be a, a, a node-independent PDK? Is yes. That yes. Node-independent PDK verification system. Verification system. In which doesn't matter what I enter, mm -hmm. revisions and everything else can be monitored. All the hooks that are missing or they're not the same can be easily identified. Um, I'm looking at the big guys because you need to have a lot of cat people to do that. <laughs> well, yeah, I know that. we started small. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that, that, that what we have to do is come together and, and basically say, all right, th these are the common problems that we'd like to be able to verify say, j just take a piece of it, verify your decks. And, and Jake is working on something that is common to verifying decks based on uh, open DFM. If you want to verify P cells, then we need to come up with a standard that allows us to specify the, uh, the ranges of the parameters that you're going to be testing. And from there we can build the framework necessary that then you can customize to make it, you know, so you, you get a basic framework that runs all of these parameters, and then you customize that to, to make it your uh, your specific solution. Are you saying SI2 is volunteering to do that? If you're a member of SI2 and, and you're a member of one of the working groups or, or the special interest groups, you guys will specify the, uh, you'll come up with the specifications and SI2 will be developing that for its members. Yeah, we're not gonna what? give stuff away, right? Because cause Jake, Jake is, oh, okay, yeah. So this can be done, yes, and I think we, we did this. We have a what, what we call Spec Explorer. That's an online system where a customer can just choose the modules that he is using, and then he just sees the specification 
that he is using. He can then also later on use it as an input into PDK and only see the devices that he wants to use and not by mistake using the MIM capacitor which should not be used in this specific project for instance. So, but I think this would be a good um, development. Yeah. And that's the type of input we need at SI2 because we are an, a collaborative R&D uh, joint venture which means multiple companies can come together come up with ideas, help us develop it, we'll do some development as well, do it, do some prototype implementation so you get some pieces that are, that you can then finish off in your own custom way. Any other questions? Well, I, I just, I'm gonna oh. interject something, but you know, you, uh, the name of the game here is collaboration, and, and I really think that has to be on the forefront. It can't be just like all the foundries have to come up with you know, some sort of way. We have to have um, the CAD teams also come up with um, some sort of standard so that, that we can work together and we can have um, more standard flow so that we can do more better comparisons. It's not just one, there's really two um, different sides of the story here. Yeah, I would also agree, uh, even if you do a lot of uh, work and, and to try to, to make the PDK more and more complete and to have an open standard to do this, uh, a specific CAT team and specific customer will still find the way, room for improvement. Oh, and we should have rather a standard interface to enable them to right. do this properly without touching too much of our stuff. So uh, like having an interface to, to do enhancements, this would be quite, quite, quite great. XML is really good at that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and, and XML is extensible. So if you if you've run into, say, you're, you're working on a process, and now you're re representing something that's not in the standard, you can add to that standard through XML. You add your own XSD or your own schema, and that would then allow you to represent that data, and if you want to make it public, you could turn that schema into SI2, and it could be added to the uh, Open PDK. And and with the tools that we're developing right now, you'll it'll be easy to get that information back out and turn it into whatever you need for your uh, your actual PDK. So, so you're, 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 you say you you're getting a base, a base PDK or a base standard. Now, it depends on where you, at what level you're getting your information. So, if you're getting your information in in the standards, so if that's what gets released from the uh, uh, from the fab, then yeah, the comparison's not at all very hard. But if you're getting it in the proprietary, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, something from a different fab or from a proprietary uh, in, in proprietary formats, it might be harder. Uh, quite a bit harder, right? So if you you get two left files, yeah. they're easy to to com uh, compare. But if you get a left file and you get some GPS code? ask but binary technology file, you're you're kind of in in your own. World. We we encounter this problem, and we are doing when we do migration, we spend two weeks to do feasibility, to prove what's the difference between the two processes. But not only at 
It's not only uh, only process. In many cases, you have for P transistors two types. In the new process, you have five. So now you have to go over the circuit and figure out who's moving to whom. So this takes time. Uh, in some cases, you have five and you go to two. Now it takes an again time to figure out who has to change to whom. So it's not a an easy infrastructure, but we deal with fabs, different fabs. So in our case, it takes two weeks. That's, that's, I think, never a push-button solution. So I think there are some tools which, which uh, support this in a way, but still this mapping needs to be done, in most cases, manually. So somewhere needs to decide, uh, I have to map this transistor to that one. But that's, uh, that's really more of a technology um, comparison rather than a PDK. I think you know, that, that we're really looking at PDKs within the open PDK system. So so you are saying, so, so you are saying, if I will have the two technologies, let's assume they are not confidential. I press the button, and the difference that comes out will be: this guy has three types P, this guy has two, these transistors have four P cells, this guy have only three. In this one, all the gates have to be horizontal, and the other one can be any direction. Yeah, that's true. But then, on on top of that, you need performance information. So you have to have standards for how do you benchmark, right? Whether, and also then it's, you know, is it, uh, is it an analog benchmark? Is it digital performance So you go back to my solution, so two weeks. Yes. yes. <laughs> so it's, a lot of times it has to be, uh, yeah, it's not push button. And it gets yeah. complex very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, any other questions? So how can we serve you as SI2? You know, there, there are pain points in PDK generation and, uh, you know, it, it's the members that decide which ones we're going to work on first. You know, be, be a member, participate, and we'll get these problems solved. Thank you very much, and thank you, panel, for, for spending your time here.